So uh, I'm going to talk uh, today about the Pine Phone and the Mobility SIG and that kind of space. Um, if you guys all want to use the Q&A uh, tab and drop questions in there, I'm hoping to have time at the end for a bunch of questions and maybe even some discussion. Uh, that would be great. Um, if there's somebody out there who can uh, adjust the polls, maybe throw a poll in there about uh, uh, people uh, in this talk who have Pine phones, uh, yes, no, or want to get one, maybe something like that. Um, that would be great. Uh, first, I want to do a, a few little disclaimers, which I always like to do. Uh, I'm not speaking for Red Hat. I'm not speaking for Pine64, uh, the makers of the Pine phone. I'm not speaking for Purism, the makers of the Librem 5 uh, phone. Uh, I just uh, involve, am involved in the mobility SIG, uh, doing mostly administrative stuff. Um, I haven't had much time to dig into the guts of things, but luckily there's a, uh, a nice little group of folks who are moving things forward, and uh, and that's that's awesome. So I just have been uh, helping out with running meetings and coordinating people and uh, package updates and things like that. So um, that's kind of the disclaimers. Uh, I can't actually, let's see. Okay, um, so first a little bit about the Fedora Mobility SIG. Um, so the goal kind of is to bring Fedora to mobile devices. Uh, and when we say mobile devices, it's I think of it as kind of this little niche area between Internet of Things and laptops. Uh, on the one hand, you have Internet of Things, which are much more designed to be um, standalone and automatic and uh, just sort of like a, a fleet of things that do individual tasks for you. You don't usually log into them or interact with them directly. You just set them up and, and gather data from them or have them control things. Uh, and on the other side, you have laptops, which are well served by Fedora and uh, Fedora Workstation um, and the desktops, KDE, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of between those two fields, there's this little area of mobile devices. Um, of course, the biggest part of this is mobile phones. Uh, almost, well, a third, you'll see I have some stats later, but a, a third of the world has a smartphone now. So they're really, really out there a lot. People use them. A lot of people are using them as their primary device anymore even. Uh, they don't even have a laptop or a desktop at home. They just use their mobile phone for everything. Um, the core, sort of a niche off of that is the tablet market, um, which became very popular a while back and then sort of peaked. And now a lot of people have switched to just doing things on their phones that they would do on tablets before. But there's still tablets uh, in use out there. Uh, a lot of folks uh, like them because of the bigger screens. And uh, if you're not like carrying them around, if you just have them in your house or something, then they're a lot more handy uh, to fit more data on. Uh, and then kind of the final, final section of that, which is just kind of up and coming, is the wearables. Uh, arena, uh, and that includes watches, uh, I've seen pendants, um, rings, all sorts of uh, wearable devices. They're even smaller than mobile phones, may not even have a display, but they have some sort of controls, and they want to uh, be interactive with the user. And you can see all these things, uh, the thing that distinguishes them from the, the Internet of Things devices is that they're much more user-oriented, they're uh, things that need an input output system, need to talk to users, need to either have a display or some way to, to give feedback, whether that's a display or, or audio or, or something like that. So um, that's kind of the area that we're looking at. Yeah. I can't kind of look at the presentation in the chat, so I'll have to uh, look back at the, uh, the chat at some point. Okay, so moving along. So uh, let's talk a little bit about hardware. Um, so a lot of people, if you talk to them about, well, we want to bring Fedora to uh, mobile devices, uh, they go, well, you know, Linux already won the, uh, the, the desktop, right? Because Android is using the Linux kernel and, you know, everybody's using these Android phones. And so, so we won, right? Well, not necessarily. Uh, Android is uh, using the Linux kernel, certainly. It is using its own kind of user space. 
Uh, it's also got a number of things that are not particularly open about it. Um, the uh, Android open source project is not developed uh, in the open with lots of contributors. It's dumped into from Google periodically when they come up with a new version, they just say, here's the new version. And sure, you can get look at the source code and, and use it, and that's great, but you don't have a whole lot of influence over what they're going to be dumping in that repository or what you're going to be seeing uh, down the line. Also, Android dev devices are very prone to uh, old source. So say a manufacturer comes out with an Android phone and, and they honor the, the license agreements on the open source on their phone and they put it up uh, for use but it's like five years old and they no longer maintain it and they don't care about it anymore and it's not particularly useful uh, by itself. They also uh, tend to have large patches uh, and closed drivers. Uh, a lot of phones uh, have proprietary uh, driver modules that talk to things like the modem and the um, wireless and the screen and all sorts of things uh, there. So the amount of things that are open that you get are not as much as you might think. Additionally, uh, most phones or a lot of phones these days have locked bootloaders. So they're locked down such that you can't put anything else on them. You can't really examine them. You can't really change anything. You're just going to be a consumer of whatever the manufacturer is, is sending you. Uh, there's a stat I alluded to, or one of the stats I alluded to earlier. Um, there's mobile phone market share right now, 72% Android, 26% iOS. You may do some math there and notice that there's 2% that's not those things. Um, and that includes all, all kinds of little tiny niche, uh, niche uh, projects. But uh, there, is, there is a share there. There is a little, uh, a little niche there. Uh, additionally, there's regulatory issues. Uh, I, I talked about the modem, or I mentioned the modem. Uh, a lot of manufacturers have don't want to release source for things. Hey, Kevin, in the, yeah. your slides are not working. Uh-oh. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Um, anyway, here's the, the uh, slide I was on. You can see there's a 72% Android share, 26% iOS. Um, so a lot of the, the hardware has regulatory issues. They don't want to uh, open source because they're afraid somebody's going to modify uh, something that would uh, transmit out of band, et cetera. Uh, although a lot of those concerns were also something that uh, laptops had for a long time and have been sort of uh, handled by just having the firmware deal with those things. Uh, also, there's interoperability with wireless providers. Um, there's different parts of the world that have different bands of, of wireless that they can accept, et cetera. Um, so that's also a, a kind of a burden at times. So um, here's some trends that I've noticed. You may disagree with me and that's fine, um, but the mobile phone refresh cycle has been slowing in recent years. Um, it was for a long time, uh, there were people, many people who were uh, refreshing their phone like every year. You know, the new Samsungs came out, I'm gonna get a new Samsung. The new iPhone comes out, I'm gonna get a new iPhone. And I'm seeing that trend as has uh, moved to a three year cycle. And a lot of people are trying to push that and make it uh, an even longer cycle. Um, they're just not that many uh, innovations uh, that people are interested in. Um, the new Samsung is sure maybe faster, maybe it has a, a better camera with more more pixels, but you know, in the, at the end of the day, it's it's not anything innovative. Um, there are the fold, folding phones that are coming up, and I think a lot of manufacturers hope that people will like those. But I think a lot of people are thinking that they're kind of gimmicks, and it isn't going to be that that uh, interesting to them. Uh, one third of the world's population has a smartphone. Um, consumers are pushing for longer support cycles. And uh, this kind of supports uh, the previous points. Uh, if you look at sales of smartphones in the world, uh, in 2018, the smartphone sales stopped growing. Uh, it, up until that point, it was growing on a pretty, pretty good curve. But in 2018, they actually sold fewer smartphones than 2017. 
And of course, there could be many reasons for this. Um, also possibly that the phones have gotten more and more expensive, uh, so they don't need to sell as many or don't uh, want to sell as many uh, to consumers. But I think for all of these reasons, uh, this is a good time uh, to look at getting the open source folks involved in this, in this, uh, this curve. Um, next slide. Uh, a little uh, history here, and uh, you all can uh, point out, uh, point and laugh at uh, these if you own any of them. Um, this is kind of a history of free uh, or open phone hardware. Uh, I actually had several of these. Uh, I had a Neo Free Runner. I think I still do have it in a box somewhere. Uh, it ran Debian, uh, and it booted up Debian. It was so cool. You could SSH into it, and you could install these packages, and it was really neat. And But it never really quite went anywhere. Um, part of the problem was it never functioned very well as a phone. Uh, as I recall, there was still a bug with the modem where if you were suspended, it would accept a SMS message and wake the phone up and then reboot. <laughs> so that was not uh, particularly uh, uh, nice. Um, and the Nokia's were, were great. I didn't have any of them, but I, I knew folks that had them. Um, they had a hardware keyboard on them, which a lot of people liked, which few phones these days do. Um, being a, uh, a supporter of lost causes, uh, I had a, a Firefox OS phone, um, and it was not great, but it was better than the Freerunner. It was not suitable as a day-to-day, -day, uh, device. Uh, there were a lot of issues with Firefox OS, which we can get into, uh, at some point, I suppose. Uh, Ubuntu had a, a touch phone that they put out not too long back. Uh, and then getting to the present, uh, Purism finally released their Librem 5 phone uh, in uh, last year. I believe they finally shipped or year before. Anyway, uh, and then the Pine phone was released in 20, late 2019, early 2020. Uh, let's see. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the Pine phone. Um, Pine 64 is a company that uh, makes, for the most part, uh, single board computers, Internet of Things type devices, uh, ARM uh, uh, chip uh, devices. Um, and they decided to get into the, uh, the open phone market. Um, they have committed to doing five years of production on the Pine phone. Um, so, Two of those years are gone, or one, really, because it was kind of late in the year of 2019. Um, so they have committed to doing that and having parts available for that long. Um, for any of you who know ARM processors, it's an all-winner A64 quad-core processor that came out many years ago, uh, well-supported with Linux. Uh, the Mali 400 uh, GPU is also uh, came out many years ago, is well-supported. Um, under Linux. Uh, it has a five megapixel camera in the back and a two megapixel camera in the front. And that's really not great these days, but uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, it uses USB-C to charge, uh, but it is a USB-C port. So you can actually uh, provide it, you're, you're booted on a kernel that supports that uh, device, uh, use any USB-C um, device uh, attached to it that you like. Uh, it has a 3000 milliamp hour battery. Uh, it's the same as a Galaxy J7, which I guess was a very popular low end phone uh, a while back. Um, I just checked uh, last night on uh, Pine 64 store and a replacement battery is $10, uh, although they're actually out of them at the moment. But uh, that goes to show you how, how cheap uh, the parts are here. Um, so it's uh, it's pretty pretty easy to swap the battery out. Also, again, another thing that the higher end phones don't do anymore uh, that may be a selling point. And the uh, the screen is a, a 5.95 inch uh, LCD, but you can see the resolution there is also not great. It's 720 by 1440, uh, pretty low end, but it looks pretty nice actually. I I must say.
Uh, so one of the nice, very nice things about the Pine phone over any other uh, phone hardware that you're going to be playing with uh, is that it can boot from the micro SD card. It has a micro SD slot in the back. Uh, and you can basically put whatever OS you want on that, stick it in there. It'll boot from the micro SD before it boots from internal eMMC. Um, so this is really nice. You can uh, easily swap file systems. You can easily swap OSs. Um, you don't have to muck with uh, messing with the uh, internal stuff. Uh, so that's very, very handy. Um, there's two, actually two models that Pine64 is selling right now. There's a two gig uh, model that has a 16 gigabyte eMMC. Uh, eMMC is the internal flash, uh, which is faster than micro SD, but it's obviously smaller. And they're also selling a, a larger one that has three gigabytes of memory and a 32 gig uh, EMC. You can see there that the cheaper one is 150 bucks. And the more expensive one is 200. Uh, the larger one uh, is their dock edition. They, they call them the convergence or something. And it comes with this little handy, uh, handy dandy USB-C dock dangle, dongle thing. Um, which is actually pretty nice. It's again, low end. It has HDMI, ethernet, two uh, USB USB A's and uh, surprisingly a USB C. So you can actually plug this into power and, uh, and a device at the same time. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, it's got hardware switches. Actually, I believe my next slide is gonna, yeah. So I don't know how well you guys can see that or if you can zoom in uh, on the picture any. I can certainly post this presentation. You can, you can grab that image uh, off the net also. Um, so it, this is kind of the back with the back cover off. You can see the battery is here uh, on the bottom. And there's a, a couple of slots for cards there. The bottom one is the SIM card. The top one is the micro SD card. And then there's a little bank of switches there, uh, six little switches. And those actually uh, allow you to turn on or off hardware components. You can turn off the internal microphone. You can turn off the, ex the ca front camera, the back camera. You can turn off the audio jack. You can turn off the modem. You can turn off the wireless. Um, and those are actually hardware switches. They actually physically interrupt uh, that so that the OS does no, no longer sees that device as being there. So that's kind of an interesting link for privacy uh, purposes. Uh, also, the number six dip switch uh, switches between uh, regular audio in the uh, audio jack and uh, serial console, which you can uh, get a serial console cable. Uh, I have one here. It's just a little USB-A on one side and then a little headphone jack on the other. Um, and you can then see uh, everything in prints when it's, when it's moving. Uh, finally, the other thing that's interesting on the back here is there's six little, uh, little connectors there. Those are pogo pins. Um, those are actually very useful, uh, going to be very useful. Um, they're coming out with a uh, keyboard slash battery uh, expansion, and it's going to use the pogo pins. I believe I have a slide next on that. So yeah, there's the serial console. Um, so this blew my mind, and I, I find it to this day amazing. The modem on this thing is a, uh, a Qtel uh, EG25G modem. It's actually a Cortex-A7 32-bit uh, ARM processor uh, with a little bit of NAND on it. And it actually is running Linux itself. And you can actually talk to it, and you can actually completely replace the firmware on it and boot whatever you want. <laughs> the uh, post-market OS guys actually have been working on a free OS for the modem. Um, it's just wild to, to SSH into a Pine phone and then use ADB to talk to the modem and log into it. So uh, it's just, it's ARM all the way down. <laughs> Very cool stuff. Uh, so some upcoming uh, add-ons here. Um, as I mentioned, the keyboard back cover battery replacement. Uh, it's going to be uh, have some firmware on it that you can upgrade via I2C. Uh, it connects on those pogo pins on the back, and it has a 6,000 milliamp hour battery built into it. 
So with that and the internal battery, you're, you're talking uh, a lot of battery life on this little sucker. Um, so there's a kind of a little movie of this. I don't know if the movie will play. Oh, it is. So there's a, there's a recent movie of the prototype of the keyboard. So you can see the phone is actually inset into the, into the top of that. And the bottom is the keyboard with the battery underneath it. Uh, and you still have your USB-C port. You can plug something else in uh, if you wish. Uh, that is not yet out, but uh, they are working on, uh, on getting it out very soon. Uh, as I mentioned, here's the little convergence dock thing. Uh, it's actually, I use it a lot for non-Pine phone things. It's, it's a kind of a handy little Ethernet dongle or, or a USB if you need it or something. Uh, also, they're working on a wireless charging back cover. Uh, it's basically a replacement back cover that again connects to those pogo pins, replaces the plane cover, and it has uh, uh, coils for wireless charging on it. Um, that one I think is not as far along as uh, as the keyboard, but uh, it should be coming up relatively soon. So. so let's talk software. Um, so there is a number of distributions that uh, have uh, Pine Phone variants or images or whatnot. Uh, Postmarket OS is one of the big ones. They actually have a lot of folks working there. Uh, there's Manjaro, there's Mobian, which is the Debian version. There's Arch, there's Ubuntu, there's Fedora, there's Sailfish OS. There's just a ton of them. Um, there's actually a guy out there. I don't know his actual real name, but his uh, everyone calls him Meggy because the, that's his site. Um, and he actually has created a written device drivers for almost all of the, uh, the Pine Phone devices, uh, the modem, the wireless, uh, just tons of stuff. They, that was his video of the keyboard. Uh, Pine64 got him to write the uh, firmware and the firmware utilities for the keyboard. Um, so he, he actually has a kernel uh, that he maintains with all of his patches against the upstream uh, kernel. And it has support for all those things. And a lot of those distros are just using that uh, kernel from him. Um, some of that stuff has been upstreamed, very little though. Um, as we'll talk about here in a moment. So what's the Fedora status here? Uh, we have a remix. Uh, if you go to the, if you just search for Pine Phone Fedora, you'll go to the wiki page that has a link to the remix. Uh, it's just using the Meggy kernel and the Fedora user space. So it's based on Rawhide. Um, I believe all the packages that we're using user space packages are in now to the main collection of Fedora. Um, but um, the kernel is, of course, the, the big thing. Um, vanilla kernel or vanilla Fedora, if you take just a rawhide image and boot, uh, it actually boots fine now. Uh, thanks to Peter Robinson, we uh, straightened out the U-boot and it boots fine. It comes up actually in a graphical uh, des desktop. Uh, however, there is no connectivity whatsoever. There's no wireless, no Bluetooth, no USB, no modem, uh, which makes it very difficult to, to get anywhere. Uh, additionally, on both the Remix and Vanilla Fedora, user space is slow. Sometimes you'll start something and it'll take, you know, 20 seconds, 20, 30 seconds for something to start up, if it's a, especially if it's a big monolithic type program. Um, a lot of the desktops are, are uh, improving rapidly, and I'm going to get to that here in just a slide or two. Um, let's go on. Uh, so, uh, talking about user space now and desktops, uh, the the mainstream desktops that are out there actually do run fine, uh, but obviously they're not suited for uh, a screen like this and a touch interface and so forth. You can run GNOME. Uh, there are dialogues that you can't like reach because uh, the input or close box is out of space. Uh, things like that. Uh, however, you can actually run a scale, uh, do a weighted scale on it, uh, on the display. And you, if you don't mind it being very small, you can actually get a pretty functional GNOME XFCE Plasma desktop um, 
obviously you're going to have to uh, worry about the input and things like that, but it actually, uh, it actually runs. Uh, there are also some uh, mobile oriented desktops out there. Um, Fosh uh, is the one uh, is a no, sort of a gnome based uh, desktop um, written by the Librem folks for the Librem 5 phone. Uh, Plasma Mobile has been around longer than that. Uh, it's making leaps and bounds. Uh, there's half a dozen more uh, out there that you could choose from. And the difference here really is, is they're oriented for that screen. So like in Fosh, uh, you can get it, you do an overview, but the overview gives you application icons on the bottom and your applications on the top and you can switch between them or cancel them or, or whatever. And it's, it's much more designed for that interface. And you get a little top panel with battery and power and wireless and so forth. Um, flat packs work fine. Uh, Air64 flat packs, either from FlatHub or Fedora itself. Um, I have several applications uh, that I've pulled from FlatHub and they just they run peachy keen. Uh, let's see. So uh, talking user space again. So right now the camera is another thing that is only supported by the Maggie kernel. He has a driver for the camera. It's not a regular driver as you would uh, expect for a laptop or whatnot. Uh, and because of this, there's a special program that someone has written that talks to his driver uh, on the user space side called Megapixels. Um, it's still not great. It's a five megapixel camera. It's never gonna be super amazing, but it's actually gotten usable, I would say now. Um, the colors are a little washed out to my eye, but uh, in the viewfinder, the colors are really washed out, but if you actually take a picture and look at it, it actually uh, looks pretty good. So that is uh, making some dramatic improvements, although ideally we want the camera to be a regular video for Linux device that can be used by any, any application. Um, there's an application called Calls, which uh, obviously does phone stuff. Uh, phone calls work fine uh, with the Meggy kernel and the uh, uh, regular modem driver that it has. Uh, SMS works. Uh, MMS is a little more difficult. It's, uh, I believe it's working now, but there's still issues. Um, Chatty uh, is a SMS application, also interestingly doing Matrix uh, and MMS. Um, there's Feedback D, which does uh, LED vibration stuff, uh, notification type things. And then a uh, squeak board for the virtual keyboard. Of course, you can use any virtual keyboard you like. There are several to choose from, but squeak board seems to be what most folks are using these days. Um, so here's the daily driver dream um, or things that we almost have. As I mentioned, SMS, MMS, voice calls working. Uh, Ebook readers, uh, Caliber works, but it's pretty slow. Um, but you can uh, you can read ebooks and manage them uh, successfully. There are several OTP applications out there uh, that are perfectly functional. Uh, there's several Twitter Mastodon clients uh, that are out there, both in flat as flat packs and as uh, regular Fedora apps. Uh, G Potter works great for for podcasts. Uh, works great as an RSS reader. Uh, Gnome Maps works, but location it, it does not work yet. Um, that is due to the modem needing a firmware blob loaded to uh, handle the GPS, and uh, that hasn't been quite sorted out yet. Um, so things we need. Here's a kind of a list of things. These are kind of my daily driver things that I would like. Um, other people have other applications, of course. Um, there's no real good weather application. There's lots of email clients out there, but there's none that are really very well suited to a tiny screen. Uh, like on Android, I would use K9, but I, there's nothing like that that I am aware of uh, in Fedora right now. Uh, obviously, we need encrypted disks and installs. Uh, Postmarket OS actually does this already. It's just a matter of fixing the installer uh, to, to handle that. Uh, also, there's no good music player or MPD client that uh, runs very well on a tiny, tiny screen. Um, 
and I'd love to hear if, if folks have know of things that do these or things for me to try, just uh, do let me know. Um, Hotspot is another thing that I don't believe is implemented yet uh, and a lot of people use. And uh, Android emulation is another thing that is going to be really necessary. Um, and there's several things going along here. There's Anbox, but there's a couple of forks of Anbox that are, are doing pretty well. Um, and uh, I know, Neil, I have not tried uh, Plasma Mobile yet. I meant to, but I have not had enough time to do it, or not recently anyway. Than, uh, than Fosh is certainly. Uh, but in any case, Android emulation is going to be needed uh, because there are lots and lots of Android one off applications out there. There's like, you know, your bank has one, or your supermarket has one, or your drone has one, or, uh, you know, all these things uh, that are just one offs that nobody, uh, nobody has open sourced yet. And better pictures is definitely something we want. So the future, let's talk about the future. Um, one thing, the thing that we absolutely need the most of right now is some connectivity and mainline kernel. Um, once we have that, we can start iterating faster on um, uh, developing the rest of things. But we need to get that connectivity so that you can load uh, you know, a, a micro SD card with Fedora and apply updates and be able to log into it remotely and uh, things like that. It's really a, a drag to not be able to SSH in and be able to use a real keyboard if you need to do a lot of typing. Um, so that would be anything. Uh, blue, I take Bluetooth. You could do Bluetooth uh, connection. I would take um, modem. I would take Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, any of those would be great. And as I said, they're all in the Meggy kernel, but they're not upstreamed yet. And I think a lot of that is because it needs somebody to clean them up and get them to the point where the upstream kernel is going to be okay taking them and to commit to to uh, maintaining them. So that's a hard uh, hard person to find. But if there's anyone out there that is interested in doing that, we would we would love that forever. Um, and one thing, another thing that would be very nice for us is if there was more mainline usable devices. Uh, Postmarket OS is working on some of the Nexus phones. Uh, if we can get other phones that are unlocked enough to where we can load Fedora on them and uh, and start using them, I, I think that would be wonderful. Um, the Pine phone is particularly well suited for this because of the micro SD booting and, and the well supported uh, other things. But um, there are possibly cases where we could have mainline usable devices uh, in the next years or few years. Uh, then once we have that, we can uh, iterate on user space. Uh, we can start producing images daily. Uh, and that uh, we can move. Eventually, once we get that going, uh, we can uh, start moving to an OS tree based image because I think that is a very uh, well suited to, um, to this use case, uh, being able to uh, flash forward and back and uh, use your apps out of uh, containers. So. Uh, let's see. I think that's that. And uh, yes, that takes us to Q and A. And of course, I have not read anything in the chat, so I'll just hop over to the Q and A, Q &A and see what we got here. Uh, all right. I guess I'll start at the bottom. Uh, Stuart was asking where the Pine Phone is built. Uh, yes, that was answered by Matthew here. Very good. Uh, yeah, they basically have a lot of um, manufacturers that they use in Hong Kong and China um, for their actual manufacturing. Uh, let's see. Um, Rickard asks, uh, I often kayak and do other stuff with cell phones. Will there be a rugged variant of Pine Phone or possibly a rugged shell for it like there is, for example, the Pine Phone? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, if you look at the Pine64 store, they already have a couple of, I think there's three cases there. There's a gel case, uh, tempered glass, and a hard shell case. Um, so you should be able to rig something up. Um, the phone itself is really pretty durable. Um, 
it, the back clips on pretty tightly uh, and I've dropped mine a number of times and it's, it's, it's pretty sturdy. So uh, will there ever be a Fedora device comparable to an iPod, kind of a phone sized tablet? Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, um, once once there's a music app, uh, certainly you could use something like the Pine Phone for that. Uh, you can use micro SD cards. I have a couple of hundred, you know, they've gotten so cheap. I have a couple of 128 gig ones. You can fit a lot of music on that. So uh, that might be your needs. Uh, let's see. Also interested interested in accessibility. Uh, I like the accessibility features for the iPhone. Um, I don't think any of that stuff is particularly great there so far, the accessibility. Uh, I think that's something that's going to come as the stack matures more. Uh, but at least I think it will come, um, whereas uh, with other proprietary solutions, it's not necessarily something that's going to happen. Uh, any idea if we might see another attempt at a modular uh, phone? Uh, I'd love that. Um, people have, uh, have tried it several times and it's never really taken. Uh, but uh, sure, I'd, I'd love it. I don't know of any off, off the top of my head. Um, the uh, framework laptop, which is uh, very repairable and modular, is uh, uh, just coming out now. And a lot of folks were trying to get them to do a phone. I don't know if they will, but uh, that was a, a thought anyway. Uh, next question. I recently learned about Google's semi-secret HAL initiative. Simply put, you can install a universal ROM into any uh, trouble compatible phone. The OS figures it out. Is the fine phone compatible? Um, I don't know. I have not heard of that initiative. Um, but the Pine Phone boots uh, with very standard U-boot, uh, the same way that your uh, Raspberry Pi or your uh, Rock 64 or whatever would boot. So uh, I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, but I don't know specifically if they've um, tailored for that. Uh, let's see, Neil asks, any chance the mobile SIG can drive a change to have AshMim and Binder, BinderFS enabled as kernel, kernel sub package for mobile? Uh, that's a good idea. Uh, we can certainly push for that. Um, I don't know of things that are using that now, but I think that would be very helpful down the road, certainly. So yeah, we can, I can bring that up at the next uh, mobility SIG meeting. Uh, the, which are every second Monday uh, on IRC. So, uh, do I use my Pine phone as a daily driver? Nick asks. No, nope, I do not. <laughs> it's just not quite there yet. But for a device that costs $150, it's really, really fun to tinker with. And I think it may get to be a daily driver. I'd love for it to. I don't want to buy another phone. I don't really particularly want to. Uh, you know, pay lots of money to Google to decide my fate and have all of my data. Um, but it's just, it's just not there yet. Um, I don't think, at least for my needs. Um, John asks, can PinePhone call over Matrix or Signal? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I would imagine that it could, um, provided you're, you need Wi-Fi for that, I believe. Or do you? Maybe you don't. Um, I would think that it would work fine. Uh, I've been using um, NeoChat on my Pine phone, and it actually works fine as a matrix client. Um, so I, I have not tried actual calls, but I can give that a shot. Uh, Mikhail asks, how is it with notifications from applications running in the background? Last time I tried it, it didn't really work. Uh, they. Uh, Fosh now does do notifications. I have not tried uh, Plasma. It probably does a better job of it because it's more mature. Um, but there are notifications now. Uh, so like, for example, the Matrix client I was using, if somebody uh, sent me a message, it would actually put a notification up that you could see what application notified and what the, the message was. So I think it's improved since since uh, the last time we tried it. But it's um, 
Yeah, it's sometimes difficult. It also doesn't go away unless you go to that notification itself. If you, there's no way to swipe it away. Last I checked, um, but it's better than better than nothing. Uh, will the mobile network complain if they find me using it? Uh, I have an amusing story about this. Um, I have T-Mobile here in the United States, and I was swap, swapping my SIM over to my Pine phone to test things. And this is before SMS was working. So I swapped it over and uh, I tried an SMS where I had somebody send me an SMS and you know nothing happened, it didn't work. So I moved my SIM back over and I got about four text messages from T-Mobile saying, your, your SMS isn't working, something's wrong with your phone, please come into a T-Mobile office, something's matter. Um, so, other than that, I have not had any problems. They they really don't care if um, I, I have used it on their mobile network fine, aside that SMS uh, issue. And if that was probably some sort of detection where they're, uh, uh, you know, have some kind of automated detection that SMS is not set up correctly. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think that there's any problem with it. Um, is any provider where you can bring your own phone, I would expect that it would it would work fine. Uh, the Pine phone actually has a very wide range of um, bands that it can use. So it actually works fairly well in both the US and Europe, um, at least uh, from what I've understood. Um, yeah, I haven't had any operators uh, freak out. So let's see. hop back to the chat. Uh, yeah, Neil mentions those things are for uh, Nbox support. Yeah, I'm not sure Nbox is going to be very easy at all, uh, but there are a couple of forks of it or reimaginings of it that might be end up being better. Um, hard to say at this point. So one of the one of the nice things about the Pine phone is that because you can boot it off micro SD, it's so easy. You don't, you can leave the, the OS that it comes with, uh, which right now is Mobian, um, on the EMC and just use uh, Compact Flash micro SD. And, you know, if you mess up your micro SD card, no big deal. It's a cheap little thing. You can pull it out, you can put another one in, you can reflash it, you can use it for something else. Uh, it's, it's really easy to test things out. Um, which is, is really, really nice. Yeah, WayDroid is actually one of the ones that I was uh, looking at. Huh, yeah, I, I have not had any prob problems with T-Mobile here um, connecting to it. Although I did actually update the firmware on the modem a while back, just when I was playing with it. Um, yeah, hard to say. Uh, MMS has proved to be very difficult, and I know uh, folks in Europe don't care or use MMS at all anymore. But unfortunately, here in backward America, um, we use MMS, all the providers use MMS for group messages, for multimedia stuff like pictures or movies that people uh, transfer. Um, and that's proved to be pretty annoying uh, to implement, and it's getting implemented as part of modem manager and chatty is doing some of it and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I think it'll, uh, it'll be working fairly well. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of what other hardware. In any case, I, I think really for, you know, $150 device, it's, it's pretty fun to play with. Uh, I think it will get to the point where if you're not picky, you can use it as a daily driver probably, or hopefully sometime uh, in the upcoming months. I don't want to make an exact prediction, but, um, and more things are getting supported uh, over time and the user space is getting better. And I think, you know, this is a good opportunity. Uh, uh, Matthew mentioned in, uh, in the council talk that, uh, you know, this is a an area where Microsoft um, had to back out because they got their selves trounced by uh, Android and iOS. 
And Android and iOS have just a massive, massive amount of the market share, but we're not trying to make money here. We're just trying to control our own fate. We're trying to spread open source. We're trying to uh, scratch our own itch. We're trying to help other people who have a similar itch. Uh, so I think this may be an opportunity for us to, uh, you know, step into that niche and widen it a little bit um, like we did uh, in the PC market. So. Yep, the, uh, it's really nice that, uh, it's really nice that it's it's so easy to, uh, the EMC can be rewritten also, you just need a, a special tool uh, command to rewrite it. Um, I actually, on my phone here, I have, uh, it came with a post-market OS on it and uh, I actually, did an encrypted install and promptly forgot the encryption password, but I boot from uh, micro SD so much that I haven't really bothered to go in and, and stomp on the EMC. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, Matthew and uh, Neil were talking about the, uh, the sentiment about the uh, de-inspirational speech about mobile. Yeah, I mean, if we were trying to uh, to make big bucks in the mobile arena, no, there's no chance. But if we're trying to carve a little open source niche for ourselves, then maybe maybe we got something there. Um, is it brickable, unbrickable? Um, yeah, I don't know really how you would brick it. Um, <laughs> Because if you break the EMC, uh, you can just boot up micro SD and if you vice versa. Uh, so yeah, I, I can't really actually see how you can break it. Um, I mean, you can smash it or break the connector or uh, break, break the uh, micro SD or something like that. But yeah, I don't, uh, I don't think there's really any easy way to break it at all. Yeah, hammer. <laughs> Uh, there's some more Q&A stuff, maybe. Uh, where are we? Um, what is the command for flashing the EMC? Uh, I'd have to look it up. It's um, it's an open source C program. I think it was actually written by Maggie. Uh, it's just a little flash thing. Um, that puts the, it basically puts the EMMC in the right mode to be flashed. It's, I think it's very simple, very simple code. I don't remember the name of it though, off the top of my head. <laughs> oh yes, let's, uh, I only have a couple minutes left, but uh, there's a, do you own a Pine phone? Uh, how about throwing in a quick little poll in there? Do you plan to buy a Pine phone? Or I, I guess it's part of this. Yeah, all right. So a lot of considers, so that's good. Uh, jump drive, do you mean, um, can you attach a jump drive to it or? Uh, the connector is a USB-C, so anything that's USB-C, you could plug a USB-C jump drive into it, no problem. Oh, jump drive, right, yeah, 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 right. Uh, yeah, jump drive is the name of that thing, yep. <laughs> uh, all right, everyone, well, I think that's about it. Um, do, if you have questions, I'm around anywhere. Um, also, if you wanna hop over to the mobility SIG, we have Fedora Mobility on IRC, and uh, I believe our matrix channel is uh, something longer than that. Um, it is Fedora on Pine Phone, actually. So uh, a lot of folks hang out there, can answer your questions uh, most of the time. So thank you, everyone. I hope it was interesting. <laughs>